Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here at Emmanuel. Uh, so glad to see you this morning. Thank you for giving us your Sunday morning. Uh, we want to honor God and love one another into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hope you'll hear that and feel that over the course of our morning. We've been working through the book of Ephesians. Uh, there's a ton of things that uh, would be interesting to read if uh, you wanted to dig into things a little bit deeper uh, in the book of Ephesians. I've had some conversations with people on the side who've asked me about some of the issues that are going on. Uh, one of those, a perennial issue within Christianity, is how does God's sovereignty interact with human choices? How does that happen? And that's a perennial issue and uh, has been a discussion through the ages. There's all kinds of good answers for it. Uh, but I just wanted to point you to a little resource. Uh, this one here, I would say um, uh, high school level in terms of reading and things that are here. Uh, it would be a great book to read. Uh, it's a little book called The Difficult Doctrine of the Love of God by D.A. Carson. Uh, and it goes after the idea is uh, how can we say that God loves the world uh, what do we mean when we say that God loves the world and yet he chooses those to come to him to be his own children? So that's what I want to talk about here. It's an excellent little treatment. I think you would enjoy it. I actually asked Sarah to purchase some copies and they're in a basket out there uh, on one of the tables that you can take out and loan or if you want to buy it for 10 bucks, you can do that too. I'm not, I have no deal with Don Carson. I don't get any uh, royalties off of this. Uh, but I just give this to you as one of those issues that uh, uh, what I find out about the Christian faith is you grow in Christ, you need to pursue your questions. And if it's true, God's big enough and wise enough to give you good answers for the questions you have. But what you don't want to do is have questions that put you at a distance between yourself and God. And so all of a sudden you allow empty spaces to exist because you're uncertain about his wisdom or his goodness or his love or you can't figure it out. How can God be fair? And therefore it creates a deadness in your relationship with him and creates space for the evil one to work. You need to pursue those questions and go after them and come around to other people who can help you navigate those. There's about 2,000 years or plus of scholarship on these issues. I think we can, we can provide some good answers for it as we work our way through. Um, I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3 today, and we're going to come to the end of the opening section of Paul, uh, but we're, I want to remind you here a little bit about where we are, the lay of the land uh, that we're walking into. We're not just jumping into chapter 3. Uh, we've actually walked our way up to that point, uh, which is a basic principle. One of the uh, sub-goals of what we're trying to do through that little study booklet you have is to promote good practices of studying your Bible. Now, we all recognize that the end goal of the Christian life is not to know your Bible. I'd rather you know your Bible than don't know your Bible, but really the end goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus. That's the end goal. And if you're studying your Bible in the way that you should, you're encountering the God of the Scriptures who's drawing you into a relationship with Him to transform you. It's a kind of relationship that makes you different. It makes you love different things. It makes you hate different things. It gives you security and confidence and motivation uh, because you understand who your God is and what he's up to. So that's really where we're heading. But if you don't read what he's written us about himself and about his purposes, it's hard for you to get to know someone that you're illiterate with respect to. So I want to encourage you to do that. And so if you don't have one of those booklets, please, I want to encourage you. It's not the end all be all for Bible study. It's not God's given. We didn't have an inspired moment where it was delivered to Van when he was up on Mount Horeb. Nothing like that happened. Uh, not lately anyway. But uh, Van uh, and I and the elders have put this together to facilitate something. But ultimately it's you meeting with the Lord of the Scriptures as you study his word. So I want to encourage you to do that. Well, one of the practices, we always want to read the Bible in its context. We want to understand where we are with the things that come before it and come after it, right? So this is why we sometimes start as we're reading this. We're trying to encourage you to continue to do that. One of the things that we often do in our tradition often is that we're good at memorizing verses. We just don't know the lay of the land where those verses fall. And sometimes when we memorize the verse because we don't know where it fits, we do things with the verse that are not very helpful either to us or to other people. And so one of the things we want to do is know where the lay of the land. So as you memorize these verses, I hope that you'll be able to step back into the storyline of the book of Ephesians and put them in context as to what they're actually saying. 
right? Like uh, Ephesians 1, 3, that God has given you all of his riches in Christ Jesus, right? In the heavenlies. Well, I hope at the end of the day, you'll know what those riches are. You'll know how wealthy you are. You'll know what they are as opposed to what often our world thinks are riches in terms of that. Uh, a Christian can be incalculably wealthy and have nothing that the world admires. Nothing, right? And Jesus said that you can gain the whole world and lose everything. But if you gain me, you'll have everything, even if you have nothing in this world. So that's the key idea. All right, so we're talking about that. So what we've been looking at, the lay of the land. Oops, I guess I should turn on my thing. I always do this. I avoid turning it on just so that you know beforehand so that I don't uh, absentmindedly click the slides forward when Grayson's singing, right? So I don't want to do that. So here's where we've been. We're in the lay of the land. We're talking about a book where a group of people live in fear of the spiritual forces. They, they are aware of the spiritual struggle that is around them. Right now, we've said this over and over again, Paul doesn't respond as somebody in the West might do and say, oh, come on, you guys, this is a bunch of hooey. This is a bunch of ghost stories. No, no, no. Paul says, no, no, there are spiritual forces and they are hostile. There are some that are hostile. And matter of fact, the major questions in life have to do with those spiritual forces. But what he wants to do is he wants to remind them of the real spiritual power that is there that loves them and has power to free them from the dark side of the spiritual world. So one, they elevate the dark side of the spiritual wor world way too high and they don't understand the God that they serve. Right? The most significant beings in the biblical world, the most significant beings are ones that we cannot see. It's not your mom, your dad. It's not the person that's sitting next to you. It's not your boss. It's not the people who could kill you on social media. It's not those people that are the most significant. The most significant people are the ones you cannot see. This is why you'll find Paul throughout his writings saying that Christians are people who look on not what is seen, but on what is unseen. Right? You can see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So Paul, right to this group of people, they live in fear. Paul doesn't say, no, you don't, you don't have to worry about these spiritual forces. No, you need to know the God that you've believed on in Jesus. You need to know who he is and that he has brought you into his triumph over every spiritual force that could impact you and that he's the God who rules over everything and he's exercised his power in love to rescue you and bring you to himself. So you can take a deep sigh. And live into that truth and be free from your fear. And so the first part, one through three, this is where we're wrapping up today, is enjoying God's triumph, what God has done, is doing, and will do in Christ by the Spirit to restore and claim all, reclaim all things. And part of those things are us, but it goes well beyond us to the creation itself. And then when we get to chapters four through six, he's going to talk about, given the fact of who you are and what God's doing and what God has done, well, this is the kind of lifestyle that he's made possible. This is what he calls you to live out right? The only way you get to chapters four through six is because God has done something so deep, so profound, so empowering that you can be bro broken free and freed from the darkness you used to live and serve, and now you've been made new. And now this is what this new humanity looks like and has been made possible because of what God has done in Christ. Now, we've worked through this first section to get us through here, and we're right at the end of it. We're here at the very end where we've underlined it, and what we've talked about here is through this little section that is really descriptive, okay? If you notice this, when we come to the last half of the book, it's prescriptive. It tells us, do this, don't do this, stop this, uh, pursue this, right? Put on the armor, one of the famous uh, from chapter 6. So, but the first part of the book hasn't told us really to do anything. It's really, if anything, it's described what Paul is doing and is described, as Paul said in uh, Pastor Steve's passage last time, Paul has been taking us through three chapters of what God has revealed to him about his purposes. And Paul says, I've written these things so that you have, might have my understanding of what God has revealed to me. So the first three chapters is just all about telling us about who God is, about what he's up to, about the center of his actions in Christ, about the power that brings those actions effectively to bear on our lives, the spirit of God, and about what God intends to do in the world. And it's a, it's a cosmic level plan. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. It's breathtaking, right? And by the time you're done with chapters one through three, God is huge. This is what praise does anyway puts God in his place and then puts us in our place. And at the end of the first three chapters, the wonder is that this God cares about me, let alone that he set his affection on me and that he's going to do it through eternity. 
And so the end of chapters one through three should put us in a sense of awe, a sense of security, a sense of, of, of wanting to serve him out of love and passion. And that's what we're going to come to. Now, but what we've learned about Paul, and this is a little bit about his prayers, he's punctuated these three chapters with two large prayers, one in chapter one, right at the end, and one at the end of chapter three. And in both of those prayers, it's the assumption that to be able to live into this new reality, to be able to step in and, and live out your life as somebody who has truly been rescued, you're truly attached to the God that rules and reigns everything, that his power is being exercised toward you for your benefit, and he's going to secure your relationship with him and bring you to fully to life. To believe that, to get inside of it, you need the, Spirit's God, the, the Spirit of God to transform you. It's not something you just get by knowing about it. It's something that you have to live into by the power of the Spirit. And so this knowledge will transform you, right? Every day, you're being encouraged to imagine the world in a particular way. Right? And one of the ways in this particular moment is you're to imagine the world as someone who has complete control over your life and destiny. And matter of fact, the only people that you should not like are the people who tell you that there's any boundaries on what you want. If you're a woman and you want to be a man, well, then you can be and we'll help you. And the hateful people are the people who tell you that you should respect your gender as a gift, as an assignment from God that you should enjoy and live out, that it has potential and opportunities and limitations to it. And matter of fact, for you to enjoy life is to live into that assignment that God has given you. Well, that in our culture at the moment is a hateful thing to say to someone. To say that, no, you're bounded by something. No, I'm not. I'm only bounded by what I want. And I'm only bounded by what technology can make me into. And so here I am. And then here we read, right, in the scriptures, we read about a God who's created us. A God who's redeemed us. A God who's refashioning us. And so we look at a, a, pr a perspective on the world that is very different. And you're, as you walk out each day, you're the master of your destiny. You get to decide what you want. The thing you won't want to have is anybody, you know, dissing, disrespecting you or stepping down on what you want to say. Uh, if you watch the TikTok world or the real world, you find all these people standing up for my truth, for who I am, for what I want. And they're telling everybody else to go do whatever, right? I won't repeat half the stuff that's said. But that's where we are. And so many of the people, when you hear about the scriptures, you hear about the uh, Ephesians 1 through 3, for us who have been transformed to live into the truth that actually you've been created to worship God. Actually, you've been created to be in an intimate relationship with him. And the problem that underlies all your problems is that you've kicked him to the curb. That's the problem that underlies all your problems. The reason why you struggle with selfishness, the reason why you struggle with lust, the reason why you live with insecurity and fear, the reason why you're struggling to find a definition of meaning and purpose is because you're cut off from the one who tells you who you are. You're cut off from the one who has designed and created you to live in a particular way. You're cut off from the very person that you need his wisdom, his power, and his guidance to bring you to life. And so, well, we're called to imagine a world without him every day and a world where we have to figure it out and make it on our own. And so Paul is trying to take us into that world, but he recognizes that for you to live into the truth, you need to be transformed to live in it. And so this is where prayer comes. And prayer is Paul using the means that God has provided to change our inner world. Right? This is a very interesting prayer. I pray that God might enable you, empower you, so that Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith. That's, one of the, that's the first prayer. Okay? And so we're going to talk about a little bit about prayer as well as exactly what Paul's doing here. Now, I want to read the passage to you, uh, and then you can stay seated here. And let me read it to you at the end of chapter 3, and this is my text up here on the screen if you want to follow it along. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people 
to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. All right, well, dig in with me. Let's start off here and talk a little bit about this prayer here. Now, I put this slide up just to see, you know, as you're reading, uh, this is just one of those things that you're looking at. One of the things I'm always trying to figure out, I'm trying to pay attention to key words that Paul uses. A lot of time an author will help us to stay on track by using key words and repeating them over and over again. Uh, also, I try to look for little structure markers, ways where he's introducing something and developing an idea. So when I was thinking about outlining my passage, I want to outline it in the way that Paul expresses it. And so I don't know if you noticed, there's kind of four sections in this letter that are set off by, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. And so he begins by drawing in when he says, for this reason. Well, what is this reason? The reason is everything he said from 1, 3 forward. <laughs> from chapter 1, verse 3, that God has given you all of his riches in Christ, from that verse all the way forward, for this reason, he's going to pray, right? So he's bringing all that, that, that weight of everything that he's just talked about right into here, and then he refers to the God that he's praying to with a title that really emphasizes his sovereignty, and we're going to talk about that. The Father, the one who is the source of every type of, of grouping of beings, heavenly and earthly, humans and, and angels, God is the Father. He is the generating source of everything that exists. That's pretty auda audacious, right? And if I'm praying to him, I'm pretty confident he can do what I ask, right? Got a lot of confidence in his ability since he's the generating source of everything, right? So begin with. Then he has two prayer requests, and actually in the NIV, what they've done in verse uh, 17b, if you put it that way, right in the middle of verse 17, they've introduced, and I pray, to say that there's a second prayer request, and I think they're right. I pray this, and then I pray that. So there's two prayer requests, and notice that both of them have to do with power. Power, all right? So we need, we need something outside of ourselves to enable us. This is not something you can do and pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. This is not something you can do just through right living, right, or staying clean, or whatever the case may be. So you need power, and then it ends with praise. It ends with praise, which exalts God, right? And also expresses Paul's desire for what he's just prayed for to happen, right? I want it to happen. I want us to be able to fully experience this, and he anticipates this, and he recalls the God who can do immeasurably more than we could even ask or think. Now, this is one of those classic verses, verse 20, that gets pulled out to be used for everything, <clears throat> right? Like you're, you're starting a business. God can do immeasurably more than you ask or think. Amen, right? He can take you from, from six figures, right, maybe to seven figures. God can do that because he can do more than you ask, right? Well, the question is, what is Paul <clears throat> excited about that God can do more than you ask? And what I want to suggest is, is he's saying that God can help you to get inside of what it means to be loved by Christ in such a way that it'll so reform you that it will, it will blow your mind. And God can do things among a group of Christians where they can genuinely love each other beside, over their old hostilities, over their selfishness, over their self-centeredness. Don't, don't fall back. Don't stand back. Don't be, lose hope that God can't do what he's done. God can do way more than you think he can do. He can heal broke relationships. He can bring rebels to himself. He can overturn the hearts of people. He can turn you as a selfish, self-centered person into a person who constantly wants to love and give it out to other people. He can do something deep. You don't even know what he wants to do. And if you could see the you that he wants to make, you would be absolutely flabbergasted. You think he needs to tweak you a little bit? God says, no, I need to do such a thorough going. He can do way beyond what you think. He can take a selfish, lustful, pride-filled, greedy, self-centered person and turn them into a person who just pours their life out so that they might have God's best for them. God can do that in terms of a life. 
And he can do that in a church, right? He can do that in a church. And any of us who have been around the people of God for any length of time and know how difficult it is for people to love one another and stay with one another and hold with one another and get over stuff with one another, you know that it needs supernatural enablement, right? So that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so three areas then, I, as the way I call them, three, three areas within the book. So plugging into God's love through prayer, and this is step one, right, we're going to begin with. And then pulling close in love through prayer in verses 16 and 19. And then praising God in response to God's love. Okay, so it's three areas. So we're going to plug in. And then the idea here, it's obvious for Paul, right, for Paul, unity is never anything that can be opposed from outside. Right? This is what's happening in the United States right at the moment, right? where we're so divided, and people keep saying, why can't be we united? Why can't we just get along? Well, the reason we don't get along is because we're not united on, on core truths about what it means to be a citizen. We're not united, right? And any kind of unity that's impressed on it is, is trying to press, you know, put a paper covering over a deep, deep chasm that exists between the people in the United States. Right? There are core issues that are going here. If you have a church, right, unity is not something that happens because we force it from outside. It happens because we all have a common allegiance to Jesus, and as we worship him and get shaped like him, all of a sudden we look like one another. We want the same things together. We're on the same mission because it's Jesus who makes the unity. We lose him, we lose the unity. There is no unity apart from Jesus. And so as we grow toward him, we grow toward each other. And as we look more like him, we behave like him toward each other. We want what he wants for each other. We love each other, right? So the, the idea about love, and we'll talk about this over and over again, to love someone, and this goes back, Augustine is the one who's famous for this phrase, it's to will the other person's best, if you're a person who loves them, it's to will the other person's best. I don't think it's sufficient enough as a definition because I think it also involves real affection for the person. I can will the best for somebody and not really have kind feelings toward them, right? It's just because I'm restrained uh, as a Christian. I want their best, but I don't really want anything to do with them, right? I can do that, but to will a person's best is really to want God's best for them. And that's where the devil in the details is, is that who gets to define what the best is? Well, Paul is saying what the best is, is to love someone toward Christ as Christ loves us. That's the best. And when Christ loves us, he not only wills our best, but he truly has affection for us. He loves us. Right? Every one of you that are a parent or you've discipled someone or you've worked with somebody underneath you that, that you love, a child or whatever, you, you, you yearn for their best and you recognize that you can't control the most important things that you want them to love. You can't make them love Jesus. You can't make them to want a life that really is God-honoring. You can't make that happen. You can commend it. You can, you can pray for it. You can illustrate it. You can caution them when they step outside and sometimes discipline them when they're younger. But something has to happen inside of them to, to get inside of that life. Right? But you yearn for it. You cry over it. That's the kind of idea... So Christ wants us to become a group of people who have true affection for one another. I don't put up with you because you're a brother in Christ. I love you because you're a brother in Christ. The unity that we have already exists. I don't have to make it. I'm called to enrich it and preserve it. Right? That's where we're called in the body of Christ. So three things we're going to go after. So the first one, plugging in to God's love through prayer. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth uh, derives its name. Now, you have to understand here within the biblical storyline how comprehensive this address to God really is, right? So this goes back uh, to the creation in terms of when God created all of humanity uh, and everything, he gave it a name. Right? He called the things as they are, and then he revealed his names, if you will, to Moses. Right? Well, name, by God naming them, it indicates that God himself has prescribed their very essence 
and he gives them a name that corresponds to how he's created them, right? So the act of naming indicates that God is the one who created them, and it also asserts his sovereignty over them. He's the one that gets to give them a name, and the name prescribes their character and also talks about the boundaries of their existence. So he called Adam man, Eve, woman, right? Now, the way that uh, Adam uh, gives uh, a picture of him being God's vice regent or of him serving in God's image is that God turns over to him the right to name the certain types of, of, of animals that exist on the earth. And so he took up that role to image God as someone who looks into the essence of the thing and gives it a name that prescribes a, a name that fits the essence of the thing, right? So when it says, I pray to the God who has given existence to every type of being, every family group, every type of group of beings, he's given them and he's given them a name. So he created them, gave them their very essence, and he gave them a name that corresponded to their very essence. And so it refers to the God who's sovereign over everything, right? It's in the same principle, your sovereignty as a parent is demonstrated. This is a little where where Judeo-Christian values come into our practices and culture. It comes into that if you go into, uh, you know, you have your little child, right, and your baby's born, you get to go in and do the naming, right? You do the naming. So they don't have a pool among the nurses, you know, right, and the OBGY, you know, uh, ward there, right? The obstetrics, they go in there and they say, oh, let's all put names in a hat. Oh, so we pick out, uh, Billy, all right, that's what we get, yay, right? No, that doesn't happen. They ask you what the name of the child is, right? And for good or ill, based on your, your child's perception, you name them, right? And you either bless them with a name or curse them with one, right? Whatever. Right? In terms of that, but you're the one. Just this past week, we were talking to one of my, uh, the doctors that's involved in my mom's care at the moment, and I was looking at his name, and I could not figure out for the life of me, his first name is Wes, his last name is Johnson, and his middle name is Javeen. I said, Wes Javeen Johnson? I said, what that? So I had to ask him, right? He says, I get that question all the time. And I thought, what, does he have some like Indian in his background, like from India, Indian? Uh, and he said, no, no, my parents really loved horse racing and their favorite jockey's name was Javeen. And I said, oh, okay. And he laughed and I laughed awkwardly and we moved on, right? So, right, those kind of those things like that. But the authority right over, and so he's calling to God and he's reminding the, the Ephesians in his prayer that he's calling to the God who has created everything, who has prescribed its essence, determined its boundaries of its existence. This is the God we pray to. Right? This is the God we pray to. And this is where the, the issue comes in here is we struggle, right, to believe that our God is this big, this capable do you really believe that God knows you better than you know yourself? Do you believe that he knows what's good for you better than you do? Better than your friends do? Better than the culture does? Do you think that the boundaries that he puts on your sexual expression, the boundaries he puts on you in terms of your gender, the boundaries he puts on you in terms of your material possessions, the boundaries he puts on you in terms of your identity about who you really are, do you think that's oppressive or do you think that's rooted in the wisdom of the God who created you? Because every day, people are going to tell you, no, no, that's not who you are, right? So many people that I know need to live into the truth that God says, right? I was confessing sin this week. He came to me, Greg, you're not my son now because you're forgiven. You were my son when you were sinning. And it's my love to you that's brought you to repentance today. My God's not a God that when he saves me, that he's up there with some big, you know, divine sunflower up here saying, you know, I love him today, I don't love him. I love him today, I don't love him. Well, he performed well today, so good. Ah, oh, he performed poorly today. No. This is a God who brings you to himself, secures you to himself, and because he loves you, he can't leave you in your sin. So he will pursue you 
until he brings you to the end of your foolishness. So we really believe that that's the kind of God that we serve. He knows who you are. He knows your limitation. I think that so often the reason why we often don't have the right vision of God is because our prayer lives and our everyday life are absent of praise. You know, when you get in trouble, this is when we pray, and usually when you pray, you skip right over praise and you go right to the bottom line, right? If you're drowning, what do you yell? Help. You don't yell, God, you're good, you're great, I love you, I'm reflecting on your character. No, right there, you're just yelling, help, right? Throw me a buoy. But if your whole prayer life is that kind of thing, then you lose sight of the God that is loving you and serving you. You lose sight and perspective on what's happening to you at the moment, and you start doubting his goodness because things around you are difficult. If you have a God who's big and good, then you can walk through the darkness knowing that you don't know why you're going through what you're going, but you do know the person who does know why. And that will change everything. So we don't praise. We often complain, right? We often complain because we think we're audacious. We think that God, we know better than God. And so when God doesn't work out our life and the timing and the way we want, we grumble, right? We want things under our control, right? Ron and I are just in a moment where just very little in our life is under our control, right? I'm under the control of doctor's visits. I'm under the control of the ravages of cancer. I'm under the control of uh, difficult issues that surround our lives. And when you try to manage those things, you recognize that you can't control all the things you really ma- that really matter. But we think we can And because we think we can control them, we don't look out to God. We look to other people. We're people that get used to not asking God very much. We think that we can handle life until it gets really big. When in reality, you can't handle life at all apart from him. So the issue here is we need to have our eyes opened to the God that we serve. This is one of the most crucial issues here. And that the issue here I put here, do we know who we're talking to before we pray for God's power to enter into the reality of his rich love for you, we need to confess that we need his help to open our eyes to just who we're talking to. And then the second thing here from this one, God's power is essential to get love. We're utterly dependent. Without God's enablement, the peace, the sense of inner well-being purpose And the power of God uh, that God wants us to know and experience will always be outside our grasp. This is not the prayer that we normally pray. When we come into this prayer, we often pray, right, uh, emergency prayers. We're not asking God to do a work in our heart to be able to understand what it means to be loved by him. So this is the, the opening, the opening request here. Now let's come to the next section. We'll pull close in love through prayer. Now, I want to suggest to you here that there's a step movement. There's two prayer requests, but they're not two separate prayer requests like bullet points. One is like the first stage, and the second one is building on the first one, right? So that's why I call them step one and step two. They're not two separate requests that are just create two different things, but the first one is, is central to the second one happening, okay? And... What's, what he's going to talk about, he's going to come back to this in chapter 4, and he's going to talk about the body of Christ, is that the body of Christ builds itself up in love. You can look at this at the end of chapter 4. It builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The health of this body in terms of its spiritual affections for Jesus, its willingness to follow him is directly tied to your spiritual health. We don't make each other healthy from the outside. We come to plus up what's already happening in each other's lives. And if we're not pursuing Christ, right, we become a sink for kingdom energies instead of somebody contributing to what God wants to do. This is why it's not our goal for you to study the Bible. It's not our goal for you just to have prayer time. It's our goal for you to walk with Jesus so that you might know his riches, his goodness, his blessing, 
his protection. And that as you walk in here, you come in with your own brokenness like the rest of us. And you come in and say, I want to bring those riches to bear for the blessing of my brothers and sisters in Christ. Because only Jesus will give you the desire to love us. We're hard to love. Right? I'll speak for myself, maybe not for you. Right? Churches, you come and you find people that are hard to love because they're broken people. They're selfish at times. They're, they're off their heads because things are going difficult in their lives. Sometimes they're so wrapped up in what's going on that you're just kind of, you know, uh, damaged by the side in their careless acts because they're so focused on what's going on. Well, what's going to make you trust Jesus to move here is the love of Jesus is going to make you move here. What kind of love is that? Well, it's a love that pursues rebels. It's a love that brings rebels and makes them sons and daughters. And it's a love that loves the sons and daughters forever. Forever. That's the love of Jesus. And as you become that kind of person, you will love somebody even though they're not lovable. You will love them despite their unlovable actions. You will cry for them and you will pray for them and sometimes you will have to confront them because you love them too much to let them behave that way, to hurt themselves, to hurt other people, to hurt the reputation of Jesus. Love will force you into the lives of other people. Without love, you will abandon them, you will criticize them, you will walk away from them, you'll vaunt yourself up over them, you'll do all those kinds of things if you don't have the love of Christ because the love of Christ does not behave that way. So this is the issue here. As you come to it, you need to be changed. I need to be changed. My affections need to be changed. And so the first prayer is this prayer here where he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, I've used this analogy with you before, and I won't take it long for the things that want to go, but one of the things I've always enjoyed about my wife is she loves to make beautiful spaces. Now, I say enjoy. Sometimes I'm not that happy about it, if I have to be honest, because her delight in making beautiful spaces means a lot of work for me, right? So uh, my wife, you know, I've joked with her before. I said, honey, I wish you cared less about more things. That's right, what I've said to her many occasions. Uh, we've got a decoration. Matter of fact, I just hung a decoration for her just after she's, she's with her mom this weekend. And I hung uh, a, a pineapple outside our, our side door. Uh, it looks nice, uh, but without my wife, I would have never put up a pineapple outside our door. Now, I like all those things, uh, and, and like all the th I love the beautiful spaces she makes. I like to enjoy them. And one of the things that's always been true is that when we move into a new space, and, and we've always, as many of you know, we've always moved into older homes that we've rehabbed. And one of the things when you move in them, uh, they don't look like you. They don't, they don't smell like you, right? Maybe that's a good thing, but they don't smell like you. Uh, they, don't, they don't have your tastes and things there. And so you, you want to come in and make the home look like you. You want it to speak to your values, really, and to your sense of beauty and to what kind of home you want to have, how you want to set it up so that you can configure it in ways to promote a certain kind of family life, right? So those are the kinds of things that you do at home. Well, we've done that at least three or four times in our marriage, and one of the most dramatic ones is when we moved into 614 South Detroit Street down the street, and we walked into that house, and it had a sea of shag carpet on the floor that had big stains on it. It had uh, institutional green walls all the way through. That's what we nicknamed it because we didn't know what colored green it was. It was just kind of depressing. Uh, it had been broken into apartments, and upstairs was an apartment. And it was kind of a sad apartment. Things were dark and dingy. We laughed about one of the walls in our room looked like a map of the United States on it uh, because the, the plaster was so cracked uh, you could pick it out. Um, we had, uh, we had a, a kitchen that the little woman who had lived there before was really short in stature and she had taken all the top cabinets and brought them down to about a foot above the countertop. So all you had was a little bit of a countertop and then a cubby hole back underneath it right? Uh, the bathroom had indoor, outdoor carpet in it, and, and I had to put a mask on and a wallpaper scraper to get the indoor car outdoor carpet out. 
all those kind of things like that that we did. It just came in. It just didn't look like it. And seven years later, literally seven years later, we finished up and we looked at that house and it was white and on the outside and green on the inside. Uh, we had taken the shag carpet up and revealed the floors. We had painted all the rooms. We had put some wallpaper, some dramatic peacock wallpaper. I'll remember that forever, those life-defying feats of getting that wallpaper up there on the stairwell. We'd rehab the rooms. We'd, we'd painted the outside to go back to the time that it looked like, the time it was built, like a seven-color palette thing that we had done. Spent a whole summer with Mr. Sanders every day, my next-door neighbor, an older man who would walk out say this every day. Hey, Greg. And I say, yes, Mr. Sanders. You see that house right over there? I say, yes. He said, I painted that house. You did? Good. It's every day. It's a conversation every day like this. I said, you painted it? Yes, I did. I said, you did a good job, Mr. Sanders. And then he would proceed to, proceed to critique what I was doing on my house. Happened every day. Every day, Mr. Sanders do that. And as we went through that process, seven years later, it was a place that looked like us. I say primarily looked like Rana right? It looked like us and a place that I enjoyed and I wanted to live in. And it was a place that, that reflected who we were. Jesus wants to do that in you. He wants to move in there, take all the crap of self-centeredness, the fears and insecurities all the thoughts of independence that you can make it on your own. All the idea that you can figure out life. He wants to take away the, 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 he wants to give you a deep security that comes from being loved truly and known fully and accepted completely. He wants to let you rest in that, enjoy it. He wants to have a person that mo is motivated by his compassion for other people, that wants what he wants, hates what he hates. He just wants to redecorate, ground up. And that's what he wants to do. And that's the first prayer, is what he wants to do. Now, a second one then, all right? So I, I got a couple pictures. I, I resisted getting all these inter renovations right. He wants us to live into our identity, our potential, he wants us to recognize with him what the real threats are. He wants us to know what the resources we are today. He wants us to know about our mission. He wants us to know about our destiny. He wants us to live into that. He wants us to live into that. This is why truly, even though your life may be an absolute chaos today, you can truly sing, it is well with your soul. That's why you can, because all the things that truly threaten you have been removed. All the things that you truly have been made for and longed for, they have been given and secured. And he's just waiting for you to say, trust me, Greg, live into it today, live out of it today. This is who you are, Greg. You're my son. This is your potential. Greg, you can bring my life to other people. You can represent me to other people. The only hope you can do that today. These are the threats, Greg, to your soul. Here's what the evil one's going to go after you, right? Here's the resources you have. You've got the spirit of God. You've got the knowledge of your security. These are, here's your mission, right? And here's your destiny, okay? So, Greg, here's live into that today. All right, now, that happens, right? Then he goes here, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love. That's the consequence of the first prayer request, is you're rooted and grounded in it, right? Now, if, you, if you've seen this, right, many of you that, that have loved, right, children in the foster care system, right, many of you have done that. One of the things that's so hard and that we know is that when that person gets passed around and passed around and passed around and they're let go and let go and let go, when you tell them, I love you, they say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And so you, you, have to, you have to demonstrate your love. And you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it. And one day, by grace, they believe it. And when they believe it, then they step into it. And then they open their life to you because they trust you. Right? 
So now that if you're rooted in grounded love, if you're planted in it and you're settled in it, well, you don't have to worry, does God love me? Am I secure? Do I need somebody to tell me like a guy or a girl that I matter? No. Do I need to have applause to matter? No. Do I need to get something else to add to Jesus? No. So all those things, you're rooted, you're grounded. Will death separate me from the love of Christ? No. Will peril? No. Will opposition? No. Why? Because I'm loved by Jesus. Okay, I can. And I'm going to add other ones. Will mental illness separate me from the love of Jesus? No. Will failure? No. Right? My old struggling life that I struggle with addictions, will that separate me? No. Jesus is just pursuing you to love you away from things that are killing you. That's what I know. Because I'm rooted and grounded. Do I have to perform today to be loved by Jesus? No. But if I get the love of Jesus, I want to delight him. That's what I want. So you're rooted and grounded and together with God's holy people. If I use this analogy, once Ron and I have rehabbed our home, we're ready to take in guests. Right? You're ready to take in guests because it's been refashioned. And I want to say here's what he's talking about is as you get your heart filled up with the love of Christ as it transforms your inner world, then you want to explore that in the context of his people. Now you've got all these people who've been loved by Christ and now they want to come together and, and love together. Because they know that that's God's plan. God said that I have rescued you in such a way that in the cross of Christ, I killed all the old hostilities. Because you used to serve the dark Lord. You used to have a heart like his. And the heart of the dark Lord is to separate people and divide them and make them hate each other. But now I've broken all that power of the evil one. I've made you my new humanity and I've empowered you to come together and love each other. And so now as you experience the love of Christ for you, your security is now you're able to take risks to love other broken people because your security in Christ enables you to stand on that platform to go into a messy world where you're going to be hurt and people are going to use you and do things. But you still keep going after them because your security is not in their behavior. Your security is in the Christ who's loved you. That's why in your marriage, you keep going back after that spouse who behaves stupidly because you love Jesus and Jesus is empowering you even when they're behaving badly. If your, if your marriage is dependent upon your spouse always loving you rightly, it will never last. Just in the same way, if your parenting is always uh, successful, only continued because your children are obedient, you would have given up like year three, right? Right? Love is funded outside of the object of its affection. It's funded by Jesus. That's what makes me continue to love people who are unlovely. And thank God, it's what keeps people loving me when I'm unlovely. Right? Any of you have anyone that loves you in Christ, you know they have loved you despite yourself many times. Who's going to enable you to do that or even want to do that is Jesus. So we need to walk with Jesus, have him transform us so that I can, I'm ready now to come have community with you. I'm ready to come together with other broken people and to live past our brokenness, to love each other because I believe in Jesus. I've experienced the love of God for myself. I want us to em- exemplify it. And I know the evil one is trying to work against us at every turn. He wants to make Bob Colliner not love me. Now, Bob, by God's grace, has loved me for a long time. But he wants him to. And it's not because we've always agreed on everything. But he wants to make Bob Collner get irritated by something that I've done. And I'm sure I've done things that have irritated him over time. So he wants to do that. But God wants us to come together. So now I'm ready to take in guests. I'm ready to invite people in. Not because I'm perfect, but because I have the heart of Jesus. That's what I want, right, in terms of that. So this corporate transformation, that we can do it together. He wants us may have power together with all God's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, right? This is one of those things that makes us aware. 
We're not dealing with something that you can just acquire by studying it. It's something that God has to do in you to help you live in it. Most, one of the saddest things in the Christian community is to know somebody who is filled with all kinds of biblical knowledge that it's not translated into the way they treat their brother and sister. That's an utter tragedy. Right? So the idea here, and that you may be filled to the measure of all God's fullness. So this corporate transformation deepening our capacity to grasp the dimension of Christ's love together. Right? Is where he wants us to go. Now where does he end? Oop, i got to come back here. This little, little, little uh, 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 drawing, which is not unique to me, uh, just a few uh, upgrades I made on it so that we make it PC and everything else in terms of it. But uh, this is the truth about what happens in a Christian life. As we draw closer to God, you will, because this is the outworking of how God works. How do you know that you're growing as a Christ? Well, growing as a Christian, well, one of the things that is the indicator is that you love your brother and sister. Right? There's so many jokes about this. You cannot be a person who's being transformed by the love of Christ and say that the church is a place that you don't want a part of. The reason why I'm a part of church and will always be, because Jesus created it. That's how I come to Christ, through people in the church. And he says that if I transform you, you will love my people. And I come back to Jesus and say, but God, do you know that some of the people that you brought into your family? Let me introduce you to a few of them, Jesus. I know, Greg, but that's your sister. What about him? He's your brother. What about, what about him? She's your brother. She, he's your brother. Let me get clear about that one. Right? All, all, all those kind of things like that. And seriously, right, all of us know that we would like some line item veto things, right, on the, on the family of God. Right? Like I told you so many times, my little daughter Victoria, when, when Victoria came and Dominique came into our family, sat there as a little two-year-old, pointed her finger at her and said, I don't want her. And many of us in the body of Christ are like, oh God, I love your people, but not him, not her. You, you don't know how hard she is. Are you kidding me, God? She's my sister. Can I make her like a very distant, long sister, way far away? God said, no, no, I've created something deep and profound between you and her, you're called to make it work and enrich it. All right. Ending. Okay. I keep going too far. So this is the final doxology. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly, immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, according to the power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Uh, Oh, it's so hard to, do we really believe that God has the power to deliver you from the darkest things in your life? Do you believe that God has the power to actually help you to love the hardest person for you to love in this body? Do you believe he has the power to actually make you into a person that can actually trust to open your life up to other people, even though you know there will be people who will hurt you? If we all waited to open up our lives to each other until we were secure and know what would hurt us, then we would all live in bubbles. The only reason that we love each other, the only reason that I reach, reach out my fist to bump it with yours and risk you just going like that, I stick out my hand and you just leave your hand at the side, or I say hi to you and you ignore me, or I walk up to you and you let me have it because I did something, all the reason I do that is not because I feel secure that you're always going to behave because Jesus loves me. I'm secure in his love. And I know I'm going to get beat up because I beat up people. My wife can tell you. I beat up people. I lose my head at times. I get irritated. I get short. I especially over these last couple weeks as the emotional energy gets pulled down. We had one weekend, Ron and I, where we just had to clear clear the decks, right? It was a pretty intense conversation. And we had one. By God's grace, we got the issues on the table. We talked it through. We resolved it on the other side. We loved each other and came back. But we're broken people. If I waited till my wife behaved rightly all the time to love her, we'd have some real struggles in our family. 
and vice versa. And so here's the call that Jesus gives for us to know his love, to live into it. I was looking at my records when I came here. I preached this sermon 10 years ago today. 10 years ago. And uh, there probably isn't a passage in the Bible that I have not run over more frequently than this passage. I pray it, and I mean this with all seriousness before the Lord, I probably pray it at least once a week for my family, often twice a week. I pray for us at Emmanuel, because we need to be transformed because of our old ancient hostilities that are still residue in us, are still there to destroy us. And they have. They have. This is why God's church will never fail, but relationships sometimes do fail because people don't draw on the resources they have in Christ. Churches fail because they don't draw on the resources in Jesus Christ. God help us to do that. Grayson, will you come and sing for us here? And then I want to pray us out. Well, maybe I should just pray us out, Grayson. So I took all the time. I'm sorry. I'm right down to 1129. Let me, let me pray for us. Uh, Grayson's my son-in-law. He has to live with me, so he'll forgive me. <laughs> That's right. Sarah may not, but okay. All right. So Grayson has to. He's family. He has to. So, all right, let's pray together. Lord, our, oh, we just need you today in every way. Well, my heart is heavy today. Uh, not really, Lord, because of the difficulties in the background, but really because of just a deep yearning that we need this truth. Lord, just we live in a world that is so divisive, and the divisions in the world around us uh, creep into our body. And Lord, we also live uh, as people who are on the way. And we want what we want. We want things uh, the way we want them. We want them at the right moment. We want them fast enough, quick enough. We want them easy. Uh, we want them in abundance. We want them with little or no effort. And Lord, you want, you want us to trust you, to live into the truth that you have made possible in Jesus Christ today. Lord, that you, by, by belief in Christ, Lord, all the things that truly threaten us, you take care of. Lord, the real threat to our life was your wrath that was over against us, just wrath because of our sin. And Christ, by your loving will, gave of himself so that we might not have to bear what we had earned. Lord, and today, all that he has done, literally to move heaven and earth, to bring us to yourself, what he wants us, to trust you, to live into the reality of who we are in Christ. Lord, please, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, would you open the eyes of their heart by the Spirit so that they might be able to comprehend what it means that you have set your affection on them. Lord, may it overwhelm them. May it put them in awe. May it settle their fears. May it to find their identity, allow them to settle into the fact that they are a son or a daughter. Lord, may it stop them striving to get approval. May they get overwhelmed with your riches in such a way that they live a life out of abundance instead of thinking that if I just had a him or I just had a her, if I just had more money, if I just had more popularity, if I was just known a little bit more, if I looked a little bit better, then I could have a life, Lord, in reality. You just have lavished them with riches and they're spurning it. Lord, please, take us deeply into the love of Christ today. And Lord, would you fashion us as your people so that we can love each other? Lord, it's hard. We want our way. We want what we want. We want to be honored. We want to be central. We want to be the person who's moving and shaking things. 
Well, we don't want to be the person in the background. We don't want to be the person that seems to be looked over. Our culture tries to tell us the parts of the body that should be honored when you want us to honor everyone equally. Lord, help us not to seek after the gifts that the world thinks are the ones that really matter. Help us just to be content with the way you've made us and the place you've given us. And Lord, help us as the body to celebrate everyone. Lord, we pray to you because you're a God who can do more than we think could happen. Lord, we, we, we're in relationships where we think they can't be fixed. We think that uh, we've given up. We think that, uh, Lord, it's hopeless and we've drawn back and we've stopped engaging or maybe we've just res uh, resided to uh, sitting back. Oh, God, save us. Help us to draw forward. Lord, impel us. Lord, Paul said that your love constrained him. Lord, constrain us, Lord. Lord, we just are so grateful. We pray in the name of Jesus with a confidence that you will accomplish what you've set out to do. And so we anticipate your work in us, Lord. May we respond as your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you today. Have a good day. Thank you.